I had nowhere to go. I wasn't in any particular rush at all on this grueling Georgia highway. I had no job, no family, nothing but my own aimless thoughts and broken dreams, nothing but my lonely cynicism for company. Sure, I got by okay. Once in a while, I sold a creepy painting or two. But as a struggling artist, my income wasn't steady. And now here I was at 30, single, homeless, still chasing a mirage, a millennial drifter without a cause. But this Monday afternoon, I stayed calm and collected. Behind my blue aviators, I stared on at the bruising sunlight. Late February, and I didn't even need the heater on, not even a hoodie. The white arctic monkey's tee and tight jeans were enough to combat this lukewarm Georgia winter, one that had been growing weaker since Valentine's Day. Like a captain cruising this smooth southern sea, I drove on down this four-lane blacktop. Not a soul was in sight. No cops, no houses, yet another lonely road trip for Lee. I'd just come back from completing a sail out in Columbus. Now with some spare cash for once, I was making my way back to my hometown, back to Georgia. I had some possible business down there. Brad Haskell was wanting me to do some gory book design. He's one of those indie horror writers. I think he tried teaching but failed at that. Haskell apparently the reclusive type from what I understand. Then again, so was I. Normally, I took the interstate, but what was the rush? Hell, Haskell wasn't expecting me till tomorrow. My family was long dead. What good would a haunted homecoming do? If I'd been on this route before, I damn sure couldn't remember. Not a good sign, but as long as this old Honda's radio was working, I couldn't complain. Even with no USB port and a CD player that'd been broken since 2016. Besides, all the surrounding farmland and forest offered pretty scenery. Not to mention shelter for when I drank a few beers earlier. I passed a few highway towns about an hour ago, but hadn't seen shit since. At first, the radio offered me solace from the boredom. But as the dull drive continued, the tunes faded away. Each channel was the same. There were no familiar rock songs to comfort me. Hell, I couldn't even find a country station or a mad preacher attacking the airwaves. Everything was scratchy. The sound of snow off a defunct TV. I stole a glance down at my iPhone. Of course, there was no service. What a shock. Groaning, I confronted the highway felt my anxiety and awkward adrenaline rise. The scan button didn't help. Every station was a lost signal in this Georgia galaxy. The turbulence made me cringe. The high-pitched pattern scrambled my mind. Up ahead, a speed limit sign caught my eye. 45 miles per hour, the drop-off so sudden. I glanced toward the speedometer, and then my heart sank. There was less than one gallon left. How the hell did I not notice that? I just filled up in Columbus. No way this shot out Honda huffed gasoline that quick. Panicking, I looked out the windshield. No city signs offered me hope. I didn't even see a house, much less a gas station. Shit, I muttered. Bracing myself for this endless montage of trees and crops, I gripped tighter to the wheel mashed the pedal down further. The speed little support for my ever-growing unease. The parade of white noise still assaulted my ears and accelerated my fears. This transmission from hell taunted me, only instead of being lost in space, I was trapped in South Georgia. For the first time this winter, I felt sweat drip down my dark beard. My restless eyes stayed glued to the highway, to this mysterious terrain. And then I saw it. A shabby building up ahead on the left, its Woodall sign so prominent. The promise of gas pumps waving me in. Yes, I shouted with a victorious flourish, and I turned off the radio. I relished this first real silence, a smile on my face. Until I got closer. Then I saw the marquee underneath the Woodall sign, 0.30, read its unleaded gas price. Holes and cobwebs covered the sign, faded posters ran along the store's busted windows. 
the parking lot long empty since 1958. This was a Norman Rockwell graveyard, those useless pumps nothing more than neglected tombstones. Shit, I said. Behind my aviators, I checked the fuel gauge. The arrow drifted closer to E. I knew I needed salvation in the middle of nowhere and fast. Returning my gaze to the open road, I stayed on the lookout for another mirage. My body shivered beyond control, the dread dominant. The rear projection of trees ran on and on, the intermittent flash of a barren field, the only other sight I saw. Never mind cars, never mind an actual human being. I stole a look out towards the woods, but even they looked empty. Damn it, come on. I faced the highway once more, my Honda feeling every pothole this old road had to offer. Despair latched into me. In my gut, I felt the gauge's weakening needle taunt me with every passing second. A blue wooden sign appeared, a handmade beauty she was. Welcome to Parrot, Georgia, the town of the long riders. It was painted with azalea flowers surrounding those letters in a colorful tapestry. The Southern Shrine, a sight to see for these sore eyes. Ha ha, yes, I said to myself. Now I really focused, did my best to ignore the unwavering unease. At first, there was just more green inferno, more of this rural hell, until the cute wooden convenience store caught my eye. Tillenhast Country Store read the cursive sign. The gas station was a sprawling log cabin, a row of many rocking chairs sat on its front porch. There were only two pumps, more than enough for such an isolated location. Chuckling, I pulled in closer. Of course, there was nothing nearby, no houses or any real competition for Tillinghast. The store with a monopoly on Desolation Row. I saw more advertisements tacked onto the main sign. Bright paint, the closest these owners could afford to neon lights. Cold beer, lotto country, cookbooks proclaimed this tourist trap. And then there was my favorite, last full service gas station in Parrot, Georgia. Now that was really something to be proud of, I joked to myself. My smirk stayed omnipresent as I made the left turn, pulled right into the pump closest to Tillenhast heavy front door. I killed the ignition, tore off my sticky sunglasses. Finally, I could exhale. Ah, oh, made it. I confided to my Honda. The gauge needle hovered midway through the letter E. We sure cut it close, sweetie, I said. Smiling, I gave the dashboard a reassuring pat. You never let me down. Basking in the calm relief, I grabbed my useless phone. Stepped out into the February heat, the perfect weather stole my sweat. Not too hot, not too cold. The bright sun a spotlight for wherever the hell I was stranded at. Tillenhast was trapped in a time warp, somewhere between 1950s small town Americana and post-recession decay. Basically, a Woodalls with a pulse, albeit a weak one. Chipped paint coated those lifeless rocking chairs. The small speakers outside played scrambled static. White noise, save for the occasional burst, of Roy Orbison's high notes or Patsy Cline's confidence. I couldn't hear much of anything except the powerful ceiling fan swirling out of control in the store. I scanned the scene. Some trepidation halted my brief euphoria. I was the only car here the only thing present from this millennium. But there were still signs of life, not just in the spider webs, but the garbage can choked full of fresh trash. The wild skid marks running up and down the store's battered pavement. One look at the gas pump confirmed my suspicions. No card reader. That technology apparently hadn't quite caught up with Parrot yet. After all, why curb their stranglehold on the full service industry? Great, I said. I faced the store's red door. The peeling paint and rotten wood made me feel as if I was about to enter a crypt. Sighing, I stepped towards it. The door burst open. 
A dying ding erupted from its bell, and there stood Mr. Full Service himself, a tall man with stringy yellow hair, his bulging dark eyes wide awake for what must have been the longest shift on earth. The gray coveralls fit over the man's beer gut and broad shoulders, a cursive Tillen Hass country store patch fitted over his heart, the uniform's cap somehow over his dirty blonde cobwebs, and the patch's name tag fit the middle-aged man's unassuming grin. John. Too weak to close on its own, the front door gave me a sneak peek at what awaited inside. I saw the ceiling fan still whirling, a wide array of stock shelves, but not a customer in sight. Um, how can I help you? John said in a raspy voice. The gas station attendant looked dutiful but distant, a black and white caricature brought to life with depressing realism. Judging by his voice, those years spent in the 50s must have really made him dependent on cigarettes. Uh, I guess uh, just filled up, I said with an awkward smile. Still staring at me, John nodded. He staggered toward my car, his steps slow and clumsy, exhausted from the grueling graveyard shift. I stopped closer to the doorway, and then I heard it. A light movement, not a footstep, but a quick dragging noise, a heavy sliding sound. Turning, I looked over at John. Hey man, do you want me to pay first? In a sudden outburst, John confronted me. No, he said. Just stay right there. I'll let you pay inside later. Startled, I stood still. The noise was now gone, gone within the depths of Tillenhast Country Store. Uh, okay, I stammered. Now my fading beer buzz was gone for good, as was the fleeting hope I felt earlier. The anxiety coming back with a vengeance, I watched John stick the pump's handle into the tank, the routine nothing more than a miserable ritual for him. I stayed silent, awkward. Finally, John faced me. You doing cash or credit? Beneath his cold stare, I hesitated. Debit. John waved inside the store. I'll scan it in there. He stole a glance back at the pump, those crawling numbers still with a ways to go. John looked at me. You, uh, you're not from around here, are you? I forced a smile. <laughs> no, I'm not. Not saying a word, John turned his attention back to the task at hand, his eyes glued to the pump's slow-ass ticker. Harsh static filled our silence. Nervous, I looked up at the speakers. Those distorted sounds still scared the shit out of me. You know… John began, his tone hitting a weary pathos. I faced John, watched him keep a trembling grip on the pump's handle. The best thing we can do is get the hell out of here. John continued, his soulful eyes pierced into my baby blues. That's all we can do. My fear only increased. Uh, pardon? I said. The pump's cryptic chime made me jump, all the numbers now dead still. You heard me, John said. He yanked the handle out. If we don't get the hell out of here, I'm gonna have to give you to him. He said, in a voice veering towards madness. Shivering for the first time in February, I motioned towards him. Look, I, I don't know what. With a frightened flourish, John jammed the handle into the gas pump. I'm telling you for your own good, boy he yelled behind a terrified expression. We need to get out of here, both of us, now. I took a step back. Nah, you're not coming with me. John marched toward me, his footsteps loud, his crazed desperation even louder. If you won't, I'll have to feed you to her, cried a southern accent crippled with pain. I have no choice. Like a cornered child, I stumbled back against the wall. 
held my pathetic hands out. No, g get back. Help me. John wailed. He reached towards me. Please, let's go. Now. Back away from me. John's strong grip latched onto my shoulders. He leaned in, inches away from my face, his stare pleading me. We have to go now. Straining, I struggled to back away, but John's stranglehold was too tight. Get off of me. Please. John yelled. Tears formed in his eyes. Please help me. His quivering voice begged, Help me. Using all my might, I gave him a hard shove. John staggered back, way off balance. His look of horror met mine, our scared eyes matching, until John hit the garbage can and collapsed to the pavement. There was a sudden crash, a gruesome puncture piercing through the tension. Oh, shit. I said... I ran up to the attendant, but I was too late. Much too late. John remained on the ground, all the fast food wrappers and empty bottles surrounding him like funeral flowers, except for one beer bottle, the one John himself had crushed. The long neck's glass stayed lodged beneath his head. The sharpest shrapnel stuck straight through his scalp, forever pinning the cap to John's blonde hair. Blood flowed amongst the Bud Light backwash, John's eyes at a cold standstill, his breaths completely gone. But the static continued, a sadistic chorus to my ears, an uncanny orchestra of scratches and distortion that never let up. I watched John's crimson flow to my feet, felt the fear fillet my flesh. Shivering in that perfect weather, I now saw blood spread out in all directions, from under John's cap, past the coveralls, through the trails of trash. All this gore, fresh paint for Tillin Hast much needed renovation. Turning, I looked towards the open front door. The clinical lighting inside lacked warmth, the isolation immense. This convenience store still awaited its next customer. Screw that, I muttered. Immediately, I hopped inside the Honda, eager to escape. I jammed the key in, turned it, the engine sputtered, gasping for breath in the steady sunlight. Come on, I cried. Another turn did nothing and neither did the next. The car wouldn't crank. Hell, I couldn't even get the radio on. The full tank had done nothing but erode what little was left of my Honda's soul. She was a horse too weak to continue, literally on her last leg. But what disturbed me most wasn't the car's abrupt flatlining, nor its futile final breaths. But the fact my gas gauge hadn't moved at all, the needle was still stuck on E. Forever. Now in panic mode, I checked my iPhone. There was still no service. Not to mention I had a battery now hovering under 20%. I punched the steering wheel. Damn it! Tears of horror slid down my cheeks. I sat there, helpless, all alone until I turned to face the store's front door, the opening just beckoned me. It provided me a faint hope, yet another mirage. I left the Honda behind, stumbling to the store, my scared steps kicked up John's blood. Then I stepped inside, saw the small room conquered by shelves and shelves of snacks, fridges of cold beer and soda. Trembling in the cold air, I looked all around me. The huge cash register was a coffin, the store's famed cookbooks made up of yellow, rotten pages. Amidst my lingering unease, I realized the front door was my only way in and only way out. Except for a door in the very back, a door cracked open just slightly. 
The ceiling fan's constant assault further chilled me. The air conditioning, the only modern luxury these mysterious store owners could apparently afford. As if Tillenhast had been preserved all these years, not through profit, but frost. My teeth began to chatter. I folded my arms the t-shirt giving me no chance against this man-made blizzard. Still, I stared on towards the back, the door now open a bit more. Then I heard that unsettling noise, the same slow, eerie drag, what must have been a long, heavy object sliding along the floor. There were no thumps or thuds, just a slimy slither. Cautious, I approached that back doorway. Um, hello? I struggled to say. A quick slam startled me, a ferocious roar through the store. I whirled around to see the front door now closed, entombing me alive. Deep in my sickened gut, I knew there was no winter wind out there, nor any person that could have closed it. The nerves overwhelming me. I rushed up to the door. What the hell? I cried. The brass knob gave me static electricity upon contact, but still, I turned that damn thing, terrified if unsurprised, to find it locked. Panicking, I looked out a window. My voice died on the spot. Hell, at this point, I felt my soul shiver. The Honda was gone, and so was John, so was the blood, all signs of our most strange fight and tragic accident, all of it wiped clean from Tillenhast country canvas. No, I muttered. I placed my hands against the icy window pane. No way. And then... I saw the rocking chairs swing to life, their paint somehow restored. All of them rocked in unison, the most customers Tillenhast had had in years, even if they remained unseen. Outside, beautiful harmonies further frightened me. The five satins, in the still of the night, drifted in from the speakers. Flawless and void of static the group's pretty performance commemorating what was shaping up to be this gas station's grand reopening. I staggered back in fright. No way, was all I could mutter through the crippling cold. An agonizing creak swept towards me over the hypnotic chorus of Tillenhas soundtrack. Cradling my arms together, I forced my eyes towards the back, just in time to see a red tentacle retreat further into the room. The long, slender tentacle slid across the floor, an anaconda arm with no eyes or snout, no features of a face or life itself. The tentacle was only blood red and covered in even redder ooze, and all the while dragging itself, making that same stilted noise I heard earlier. The cold breath struggled to escape my lips. I stood there in terror, watching that limb disappear into darkness, back to wherever the hell it came from. Lying near the doorway, I saw the creature's gift, like a Christmas present laid out just for me, one I didn't ask for. Those pair of gray coveralls awaited my touch. My body, my enslavement. In Georgia's frozen tundra, I marched toward the uniform, defeated, despondent, and still scared. I stopped and stared down at them. Tillenhas Country Store read the patch. Then I saw the patch's inevitable name tag. Lee, it said in that flashy cursive. We need to get out of here. John's paranoid voice blared through my mind. Both of us. Now. I confronted that back room. 
not dare stepping any closer. I could still hear John's painful pleas. If you won't, I'll have to feed you to her. His voice driven by the desperation of a man on a nervous breakdown or on the brink of death. I have no choice. Help me, please. Let's go. At least the uniform would keep me warm for those eternal shifts. At this steady job, I never wanted. I gazed around my new office, my new home. Sure, the snacks and alcohol would alleviate some of the pain, but only some. And sooner or later, I'd have to go out there to fulfill my duties as the last full service gas station attendant here in Parrot, Georgia. Fulfill my duties for both Tillen Hast and the monster in the back. So the next time you're driving home from Columbus or Atlanta, stop on by. Let me pump that gas for you. Make small talk with you in our friendly little town. Because boy, do we need customers.